still believe right now? Come on now, come on now. Who's excited for Easter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the beginning of spring is exciting times. And if, if you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm Pastor Amon. If you don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm an excitable guy. Like, I, I love excitement. I mean, who doesn't, right? But we, we all know reality that disappointment is soon to follow in some cases. It's not always exciting times. And, and whether or not we ever experience excitement, we all will experience disappointments at various levels. There's going to be all sorts of disappointments that you'll have to go through. Maybe you're someone who's, who spent months looking for a job, and you finally got an interview, and, and you thought it was the perfect one for you, and then they hire somebody else. Or maybe you're, you're someone who's gone through, through a marriage that, that's been difficult, and then you get that, that punch to the gut of unfaithfulness, and now you're left to, to pick up the pieces of that. Or maybe, maybe you know, it's, it's, it's lower stakes. Maybe you're someone who's a student, and you've been studying all night for a test, and you're going to ace this, and you go in, and you fail it. We've all had to deal with disappointments of some kind. When I was thinking about the disappointments in my life, the one that, that came to my mind first was one that we experienced uh, about three years ago, my wife and I. I'll give you a quick bit of background. Uh, I have not grown up a Christ follower. I grew up in church, but uh, I, I thought I knew best, and I did my own thing, and I ended up lost in drinking and marijuana use. And when I met my wife, um, I wanted to be better, so I tried to be a better husband. It didn't work. We had a child. I thought, this is my chance for redemption, so I'm going to be a better, I'll be a good father. I'll be a better father than the one I had. And you guys, that's when I recognized that I was bankrupt in the ways to be able to do anything to actually improve my own life. And I was failing time and again as a father. And my wife, she's left to hold the pieces, trying to keep this family together with the little one and then the husband who's stoned on the couch all the time. That was the reality. And when I found Jesus, he changed all that. He turned my life around, you guys. He set me on a whole new path that I would have never planned, I would have never guessed. And... And he, thank you, Amy, praise God. And, and he gave me something that I hope you guys experience if you haven't yet, hope. He gave me hope. And you guys, that hope was filling up inside of me. And, I, and I've always had a desire for children, and I wanted to have more. And I'm turning to my wife, who's, who's had to go through three years of stoner father. And I'm like, hey, all right, I got Jesus. Let's have some more kids. Now, how many of y'all know that that's probably a hard pill to swallow, she, she had not yet experienced all that Christ was doing in my life. And, and I'll tell you guys, it, it took some years. There was a lot of begging and pleading. And Come on, baby. It's time, right? Look, I'm a new man. I'm a new man. And four years, praise God, four years later, she finally said, okay, let's do it. And, and, and praise God, it wasn't even a quick journey to get pregnant. We were pregnant like that. And, and then five weeks later, the baby stopped growing. Didn't see that one coming. I was, I was hoping and I was praying and I was waiting. I was waiting on the Lord and got the punch to the gut. The baby stopped growing. Many people in this room, I know, have experienced an almost identical story. There's a lot of people that have got little ones in heaven that they're waiting to see when their time here is over. And there's other folks that have disappointments at a different level. But we all, on one level or another, experience disappointment. What do we do when that hits? What do we do when we have the shock of what we expected not being the reality and the rug is pulled out from under us? That was where I found myself three years ago. How do you recover from that? What is it that, that God would have us to do? I mean, the disciples, when... When they were celebrating on Palm Sunday, which is the day that we, we memorialize today, they were celebrating. They were expectant. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. He was coming in as their king, the king that they wanted. They were, they were recognizing their, the Roman oppression, the rule of Rome would be over, right? They were expecting that to be gone. They were looking for revolution. They saw the change maker coming in. They had the king finally that they wanted. Things were good. It was high time. 
Let's read quickly the, the, the couple of verses that really give us a picture of the celebratory atmosphere on Palm Sunday. It's found uh, actually throughout all the Gospels, but we're going to read a little bit in John right here. In John chapter 12, in verse 12, it says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out, out to meet him. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So they were praising, y'all. They had their palms. They were waving them. They were excited. Here it is, the day we've been waiting for. Things are going to change. And Sunday, if y'all know the story, Sunday eventually becomes Friday. And they are, are stuck dealing with disappointment. Now, Jesus, throughout that week, he begins to, to drop hints, and then he gets really clear about where this is going. He wants to let his folks know, you need to get ready. It's not going to be Palm Sunday forever, right? He needed to, them to know where this thing was going to end. And, and Peter is one of those that, that Jesus tended to take by his side and, and tell more clearly things. He was really prepping him to lead the group. And Peter was in disbelief about what was going to happen. He didn't want to think that this king of his, the, the expected savior of all, was going to end up dead on the cross. And we find uh, as Jesus is telling him this, this Peter's like, whoa, whoa, no, 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 Jesus, wait. I think you got it wrong. See, you come, everything changes, and then it's all good, right? We're going to go and we're going to spread your word and it's going to be great. And then Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So he's letting him know, hey, 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 that's great that that's your expectation. But this is the plan. This is where I am telling you we are going. So he's, he's prepping. He's prepping Peter for it. And then he goes on even in, in John and gives the rest of the disciples a bit of fair weather instructions. Like, hey, it's nice right now. The sun is shining. It is Sunday morning. But check it. I need you to know something. And he says this in John 12, 35 through 36. He says, my light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can. So the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they're going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. So he's basically telling them, celebrate now. Enjoy my presence now while you've got me here with you. Because there's going to be a time where there won't be this light. You won't see this shining light. You're going to be surrounded by darkness. He says, you're going to be at a crossroads while I'm on a cross. And you're going to need to decide whether or not to keep the faith. So he's telling them to trust now while trusting is a little bit easier. You know, it's easy to trust God on Sunday morning, right? When the worship band is playing and you are feeling the spirit and your hands raised high. But what about on Friday night? What about when that dream looks to be dying? What is it that you are going to do there? And, and in this message here, we're going to briefly take a look at Peter's response to the, the, the disappointment of that Friday night coming. And uh, we'll see that they don't really respond the way, Peter included to the rest of the disciples, they don't really respond, respond the way that we would expect Jesus is like mighty 12 to respond. Actually, on Thursday night, when, when they come, the, 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 the priests come and they arrest Jesus, and he's betrayed by one of his own, you see all of the disciples flee. They take off. They're gone. They're nowhere to be seen on the scene. But we're going to examine Peter because he's one that actually has a little bit different response in addition to just the flight. All right. So let's look at his story through um, the account of Luke. In Luke 22, we will see uh, how Peter responds in his darkest days and disappointment. So I want you to set the stage real quick. So this is right when the, uh, the, the priests have now uh, taken a hold of Jesus and they are, they're ushering him away. And they are getting ready to begin the process of sentencing him to death, which then will lead to the cross. So it says in fifth, verse 54, 
Then seizing him, him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. Isn't that like the first sign of trouble right here? Not that they're, they're leading him off, but that Peter's following at a distance. Did y'all see that? I mean, is, can, you, can you actually really follow at a distance? You know, like if you're following, you're, you're close to who you're following. That's what, that's what God is really calling us as disciples to do, to follow him closely, not at a distance. So we're already seeing here that Peter is getting it wrong. I mean, he's not following, he's just watching. He's just watching to see how this goes down as opposed to following the master. So let's go on. In verse 55, and when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. Now these some, these are, are some of the guards that, that are in the party that are, that have escorted Jesus to the high priest's house. On 56, uh, a servant girl saw him there, or seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this, this was the man with him. This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. <laughs> a little later, someone else saw him. You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly, this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. That the, I'm sorry, remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So here we see that, that Peter, given this opportunity to really display what it means to be a, a disciple, given this opportunity to, to really make the, the message go viral through him, to be a contagious Christian, he fails the test. He, he, he disowns Jesus in the moment where it would seem that Jesus might need him the most. So we get an idea of, of what not to do by looking at, at the way Peter has responded here. How should we handle disappointment? So the first way that we should handle disappointment is by remembering that God has a plan. You see that? It turned. Things changed for Peter in that moment when Christ looked at him and then he remembered. Did you guys see that? It's not that he didn't already know, but he remembered what God had said. He remembered that God had already had that plan. That this was going to happen. If you guys uh, don't know the story, when, when uh, Jesus was coming in to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, it wasn't that he just was like, oh, we're going to come in here, it's going to be awesome, oh, yeah, we're going to uh, put me on this thing, it's going to be great. No, he, he actually knew the prophecies. He knew the way that it was foretold that the Savior of all, the Messiah, would need to come in as the King of Israel. So he told his servants, go get me a donkey's colt. I'm going to need to come in on that. He was setting the stage. He was walking out his plan. So we, as his followers, when, when disappointment comes, as we know it will, we need to remember that God has a plan. And, we, and when we're in our, our, our hardest moments, it's easy to forget sometimes, right? Sometimes there's, there's so much that's, that's going on around you. There's, the enemy will throw the book at you and anything he can to get you to shake to get you to keep your focus off of Jesus, to get you to forget the plan. So in those moments, we got to recognize, I need to fight to remember this plan. I need to fight to remember this plan. I remember when uh, I, I had that, that disappointment moment when we were sitting in the, the doctor's office and they showed us on the ultrasound that the baby was not where they were supposed to be and that the baby had actually, like, we'd actually gone in maybe on week seven, and the baby had stopped growing at week five. So it was, it was a dark day. Let's put it that way. It was a dark day, and I didn't know how to respond. And usually when I get angry, actually, I, I, I will shut down for a little bit. I will just, I'll go into silent mode. And I, and I did that for a few days. And then when I finally got up the courage to seek the Lord, because I was, I was a little angry with him, let's be honest. When I got up the courage to seek him, he reminded me that he had a plan. He didn't tell me what it was, and that would have been awesome to know. 
would have been awesome to get the plan. Like, thank you for the blueprints, Jesus. But he doesn't do that. He just, he just reminds us that he's got a plan, that he's in control, that he's sovereign. God is still on the throne when the lights go out, when it's dark. He has not walked away and left us to fend for ourselves. We don't walk through disappointments alone. So what, what God was really telling me there was that I need to trust him in the dark. And that's our bottom line for today. If there's one thing that you walk out of here remembering, it's that whatever comes your way, you need to trust him in the dark. Trust him in the dark. And it's not going to be easy, so we need to pre-decide that we're going to do that. We need to pre-decide. We need to decide in advance. I'm going to trust him in the dark. I'm going to remember that God has a plan. I might not know what it is, but I'm going to trust him. And I won't follow at a distance. I'll come close, Lord. And I will trust you in the dark. So pre-decide that that will be our response. We've got to fight to do that, though, because the enemy is not going to let you do that easily. He's going to try to blind you. So you're going to have to fight to trust him. You're going to have to fight to remember. Do you got fight in you, church? Are we fighters? Are we going to stay laced up for battle when it comes? All right. Now, not only did Peter forget that Jesus had a plan, he, he also let fear control his mouth. Now, that can often happen to us, can it? I even told you my, my immediate re- reaction there when I heard the news was I shut it down. My emotions we're riding and taking over. They took the reins. But we got to recognize that that's coming and be prepared. So let's look at um, the ways that, that Peter wrongly responded here. So not only was he following at a distance and he'd forgotten the plan, but he did not speak out of, in favor of the Lord. He was actually speaking the opposite. Not only was he professing, yes, I follow Jesus. He was saying, no, I don't know him. I disown him. I got nothing to do with him. You know, it's easy to follow a winner, right? I I bet you if I ask for how many Patriots fans in the house, huh? But when they're losing, where are you at? (laughs) When when all looks like it's lost, what are you saying? So our, our response needs to be the opposite of Peter's here. We actually need to praise through the pain because pain's coming. Pain is inevitable. But are you going to praise him through it? Amen. Now, just like the disciples did on Sunday morning, they were, they were all up in arms excited. Jesus, hallelujah, Hosanna. And that was a huge crowd of disciples. They didn't say it was just the 12 there. There was a ton of disciples. Where are they all at? Where did they go? They were gone. I don't hear any praises shouting across town in the direction of the priest's house. It is silent. And Peter, the one who followed him closer before, is not only not silent here, he is speaking out in the other direction. So we, instead of doing like Peter and giving our tongue over to fear, we need to give it to the Lord. We need to praise him. We need to praise him. We need to declare out of our mouths the greatness of God. We need to shout to the rooftop how awesome God is. Not just because of the the blessings that we've had, but because we know he doesn't change. He's the same God in the darkness that he was on Sunday morning. You've got the same hope carrying you through. Come on, that's right. Can we get a praise party right now? That's right. God is good. Amen. He gives us plenty of of places throughout Scripture where he's directing us what to do with our mouth. In Hebrews, the author of Hebrews even says that it's not going to be easy to praise. He calls it a sacrifice, right? It's not always easy to praise. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So now we can see why Peter wasn't praising, because he wasn't professing anything. He was denying Christ. So the fruit of lips that openly profess his name is praise. Our goal is, is to lift him up. And in um, Philippians 4.4, 4, it even tells us to rejoice. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Psalm 31.1, sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. We lift him up. We elevate him above our circumstances. Even in the pain and the dark of night, we put Jesus on high and we get our praise on. 
That's the way that we fight through it. Now, there's, there's plenty of examples of, of people that have gone through struggles that we might not ever in, encounter, hopefully. Job is an example of one. Job was an amazing example of how we kind of should respond here in, in the darkest of night, in the, the hardest of struggles. If you don't know Job, you should get to know his story. He, he lost it all. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. He lost his health. Like anything that we would hold on to as a, as a temporal, as, a, as an earthly reason to praise God, gone for Job. He had, he had nothing to really look at and say, this is why I should praise. And yet this is what we hear from Job. In one, Job 1.20, he says, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. He knew his praise was not dependent on what he had. His praise was not dependent on his wealth, his family, his health, any of those blessings. His praise was already going to be lifted up to Jesus no matter what. That's the response that we need to have, and it's not easy, right? It's not easy. I'm not standing up here telling you guys, oh, yeah, just go praise. It'll be awesome. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be a struggle. When that, that first date you had in years is a train wreck. Are you going to praise God that, man, thank you, you didn't put me into that relationship. <laughs> when, when the home that, that you've been holding on hope for, that you've been expecting, that you've been saving up for, when the contract fails and falls through, are you going to praise God that you still got a roof over your head right now? Amen. When, when, when that promotion that you wanted goes to the next guy, is God still your God? Are you still going to lift his name on high? What has God done in your life? What has he done in your life? Is that reason enough to praise him? Check it, check it. If he has done nothing but save you, is that reason enough to praise him? If he never does another thing for you, is that reason enough to praise him? God doesn't change. He's the same God that you had on Sunday morning. He's there with you throughout the week. All the time, he is with you. Stir up your faith in the storm. Stir up your faith in the pit. In the trial, stir up your faith. Expect big things from God. He's not going to let you down. He might not come through the way you expect. He's not always going to be the king you want. Well, guess what, y'all? He's always the king you need. He's always going to give you what you need to take you from glory to glory to glory. Will you remember he has a plan on Friday night? Will you praise through the pain on Friday night? And will you fight to do that? Will you fight to be that church? You've got to be ready, church. You never know when Friday night could be upon us. You never know when all will go dark. You've got to know that Jesus is your Lord. Are you going to panic? <laughs> no, we're going to trust him in the dark. We're going to remember God has a plan. We will praise him through the pain. That's your knockout combo. Take out the devil with it. Then you will see that you've got the light. You've got the light. Even when darkness overcomes you, you've got the light. And before you know it, church, before you know it, the season will have passed. Yeah, that's right. And you will be back in the next Sunday morning. How many know that there's going to be another Sunday? There's going to be another season. Friday night does not have to be the end of your story. Now, we might want to think that it's going to happen fast. It might not happen tomorrow. I don't know where you're at. But you've got to stay in the fight. Keep your dukes up. Keep swinging. The enemy is not quitting. Are you? In that, last, in that last bit of disappointment, after the Lord had urged me to remember he had a plan, he then called me to his word, and he gave me a verse that uh, just ministered to me. So if you're someone right now who's in a Friday night, I want you to hear this. 
in, in Habakkuk 3.17. Though the fig trees, the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine. Though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. When he gave me this verse, y'all, I was struck by the visual in 17. There's no cattle in the stalls. My five-week-old baby, gone. No cattle in the stalls. That was, that was my harvest. That was what I was expecting him to come through with. But then 18, verse 18 comes. And yet... And yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Though your Friday night looks empty, joy comes in the morning, right? Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. I didn't know what my my Sunday was going to look like. I didn't know that I was one day going to have a son that would not have been had it not been for that Friday night experience, my son Mateo, in all his crazy hair glory, that, that kid is a product of what it is that Christ is doing in my life. The praise, the praise that I just want to give the Lord just for even having him. I, I didn't think it was going to happen. I thought that that hope was lost. But you've got to know there's a next season, and you've got to fight until you get there. you got to keep fighting until you get there. I know some of you guys are going through marriage struggles right now. Are you going to fight? Are you going to fight? Don't, don't hear me telling you how to work out your marriage right now. But hear the Lord. Seek the Lord. And there's going to be a fight one way or another. So you've got to stay in that fight. You've got to keep swinging. Don't, don't run to alcohol. I've seen that too many times. I've been there too many times. Don't go that route. I've seen people end their lives because they weren't able to trust him in the dark. Can you be that church that trusts him in the dark? We've got a possible Friday night coming up for some of us. As a church, people might be looking at this next season and thinking, this is a disappointment. But know that God has a plan. Remember, he has a plan. Right? And we need to praise him through this. Praise him through this. Don't let bitterness and gossip take control of your mouth, but offer it up to the Lord and praise him. And predecide that whatever comes, whatever our next Friday night is, that we are going to remember his plan. And that we're going to praise him through it. Let me pray for y'all. Father, whew, we are grateful. We don't just praise you for the blessings that we've received. But we praise you for who you are. We praise you that you looked down and you thought of us. We praise you that you came to save. And we celebrate you today on Palm Sunday, arms lifted, raised high, celebrating you, Lord. And we ask that you empower us to praise you on Friday night when we're in that season where it feels like all hope is lost. Lord, we need you to do it. Will you empower our praise? And Lord, I pray right now for the folks right now listening to this message that they are only hearing what's from you in it, Lord God. I ask that you would solidify a truth for each and every person here today and give them a word to walk away with. We thank you that we, because of you, even know that there's a plan. And we thank you that we've got someone as worthy as you to praise. In Jesus' name.